There should be no doubt that climate change presents a real and imminent threat to the economic livelihoods of millions worldwide. Whether it be through exacerbating drought or extreme rainfall, agricultural activities will be badly hit and food insecurity will astronomically rise. We have already seen the first climate change refugees this decade, and the UN predicts there will be at least 50 million more if we continue our emissions trends. At this point, 97% of scientists worldwide agree that man-made emissions are driving climate change. According to the IPCC and many reputable climate change simulations, we should expect to see a 2.5 to 10 degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature over this century. An increase of such severity will trigger several positive feedback mechanisms in the Earth's climate system, exacerbating the changes already being observed today. We will see an increase in weather severity, wrecking havoc on our infrastructure, agriculture, biodiversity, and human progress as a whole. On the domestic side, researchers project climate change to have a significant effect on the U.S., stressing freshwater reservoirs like the Colorado River and the Mississippi Delta, which has lost over, already over a third of its coastal plains over the 20th century. In the southwest as a whole, annual springtime precipitation is projected to decrease and severe droughts will intensify, catalyzing water scarcity in the region. Additionally, rising sea level poses a threat to coastal communities. In the Mississippi Delta, sea level is rising at a rate of 0.32 inches per year, and the sea level of coastal Virginia is projected to rise by about 3 feet by 2100. The United States will soon see its first climate change refugees as the coastal communities in Alaska are expected to be completely submerged underwater within the next 10 years. Climate change is already a significant market failure for the U.S., especially in the agricultural sector. Wetter springs delay planting crops, hot and dry summers reduce yields, and warmer winters allow crop pests and pathogens to thrive. A 2006 drought cost the North Dakota's livestock industry $32 million because of higher grain prices and cost farmers upwards of $425 million. Pests have cost wet Midwestern farmers around $78.5 billion worth of crops annually. With California anticipating an increase in temperature and decrease in humidity, the state is projected to see a $4.3 billion decline in its agricultural, forestry, and fishery sectors annually. It is imperative that we look into energy options that don't interfere with our fragile climate systems. Thus, a shift towards green technology is necessary and fortunately, we have seen significant progress in this field in terms of job creation, energy output, and long-term sustainability, as we will soon discuss. Renewable energy has proven to have great economic benefits for the United States. In 2012, over 119,000 jobs were created in the solar industry, with an additional 75,000 jobs in the wind industry. Wind power made up 42% of all new U.S. electric capabilities in 2012, amounting to a $25 billion investment for the U.S. economy. In the hydropower industry, Navigant Consulting estimates 200 to 300,000 direct jobs, meaning two to three full-time jobs per megawatt for the existing 100,000 megawatt fleet. Renewable energy projects are also used to help pay property and income taxes. Wind projects in Iowa, for example, generate more than 20% of its energy from the wind, providing more than $19.5 million in annual property tax payments to state and local governments in 2011. Practicing aggressive energy efficiency measures with a 30% renewable portfolio target for 2030 can generate over 4 million full-time job years and increasing nuclear to 25% and carbon capture and storage to 10% of overall generation can yield 500,000 more job years by 2030. The bottom line is that all carbon-free technologies create more jobs per energy generated than coal and natural gas. Building and Maintaining renewable energy facilities are labor-intensive and create proportionally more jobs than the fossil fuel industry. For every $1 million spent, clean energy generated 16.7 jobs for the 5.3 in fossil fuels. Thus, 
Clean energy generates over triple the jobs as fossil fuels for the same amount of investment. Oil and natural gas composed 0.8 jobs, and coal contributed 1.9 jobs. Wind, solar, and biomass power generation make 4.6, 5.4, and 7.4 jobs respectively. Investments in renewable energy are also typically kept locally, as installing renewable energy facilities primarily use local workers. These workers include a plethora of specialists, like electricians and carpenters to retrofit buildings for energy efficiency, civil engineers and welders to expand mass transit, and software engineers and electrical engineers to develop the smart grid, among others. Renewable energy is an efficient source of new jobs, and its development has an immense prospect for economic prosperity. Having the United States step up in regards to climate change legislation would not only be in its best interest, but it could set a strong example for other nations who have failed to address this issue in the past. In order to move forward, the primary focus needs to be on a bipartisan method of carbon mitigation. Thus, we believe that a carbon tax with 100% dividend and an extension of the renewable tax credits would be a practical and effective solution. A tax on carbon would be successful in cutting emissions, while simultaneously pushing the energy sector toward alternative energy sources and the necessary investments in smart grid technologies. Although there are claims that a carbon tax is less responsive to market volatility than a cap-and-trade method, we believe that a tax would be less susceptible to corruption and externalities. In the wake of Solyndra and other failed green startups, the security of government oversight would provide assurance for the American people especially compared to a third-party permit system that cap-and-trade would require. In 2012, the Congressional Budget Office discussed the feasibility of a carbon tax in the United States. It suggested a $25 tax per metric ton of carbon dioxide and a 2% real annual increase. If this were implemented, the United States could see a $1.06 trillion increase in revenue over the next nine years, taking into account the economic ramifications of a tax increase. Carbon taxation has been effective in several settings outside the U.S. In particular, we are interested in investigating a case study of the carbon tax implemented in British Columbia in 2008. The carbon tax was source-based and it applied to 77% of all greenhouse gases in the province. Similar to CBO estimates, this tax started at $10 per metric ton of carbon dioxide and increased $5 every year. Overall, the carbon tax allowed for a period of increased growth while simultaneously cutting emissions. Petroleum decreased by 20% following the tax implementation, and British Columbia saw a higher GDP growth rate than any province in the last four years. Extensive research has shown that carbon taxation has little to no economic impact in the long run. We can see this trend continue in looking at British Columbia. This can be attributed to the fact that it was a tax shift rather than a tax increase. In this specific case, the carbon tax was balanced by a 5% reduction in the corporate in income tax and the two lowest tiers of the personal income tax. Additionally, low-income families were supplied with an annual $200 stipend. A revenue-neutral approach is critical in a legislative context. Since there is no increase in revenue, this approach abides by the Norquist Pledge signed by a majority of House Republicans. Grover Norquist himself has explicitly approved of the fee and dividend form of carbon taxation that we have discussed. Bob Inglis, a former Republican congressman who is now executive director of the Energy and Enterprise Institute, believes that Republicans would support a carbon tax if income and or corporate taxes were cut. With Congress in such a hostile state, it is critical to seek bipartisan support for carbon mitigation. In the case of fee and dividend, we feel that this accomplishes its objective in ways that cap and trade mechanism could not. Since the early 1990s, the production tax credit has attributed to the success of many green energy companies. Congress, however, has failed to take a firm stance on this particular issue, and unfortunately, this indecisiveness has allowed the PTC to continually expire. Without extended tax credits, the renewable sector is unable to experience the necessary growth to attract investors. Establishing a robust green energy sector has proven to be a vital component in other developed countries around the world. Thus, we believe that a smarter model for tax credits is needed to combat the political uncertainties of their renewal. When it comes to the renewable tax credits, we want to create a more efficient method than the current across-the-board style, which has failed to live up to its growth expectation. The policy would be an energy tax credit that goes into effect at a state level. The idea is straightforward enough. 
leaving the tax credit distribution process up to the states, would allow for the capitalization of the clean or renewable energies that each state produces most efficiently. Intuitively, this makes sense. When comparing a map of the United States to its respective clean energy infrastructure, we can see a direct relationship between the type of clean energy and the geography it manifests. In short, the majority of the country's solar farms are found in the west and southwest, while the majority of wind farms are found in the Midwest and Great Plains. By utilizing the geographic systems in each respective region, we can take advantage of our natural strengths in order to diversify our clean energy options. Allowing this tax credit plan to be state-specific takes a nuanced approach that will provide long-term stability. Using what we refer to as the energy tax credit minimum, our plan will promote innovation of cleaner energy production, just like the carbon tax. As stated earlier, the goal for this policy is to create a smarter nat national grid through a state-specific system, and the energy tax credit minimum is a large proponent of that. The basic premise is that a certain percentage of the tax credits available, between 60 and 70 percent, would be the minimum amount required to go to the state's two most feasible or lucrative renewable energy options. This idea still allows the state to choose its energy options within set parameters, while also ensuring that America is getting the most out of its clean energy capabilities. As a byproduct of clean energy innovation, each state's cost of energy is liable to shrink. On a state level, an average of 21% of each state's annual budget is allocated for energy expenditure, about $2.7 billion per state. The policy is a self-perpetuating one. The sooner we get started, the sooner we will see environmental results clean energy innovation, and a decrease in energy cost. This market-based solution should provide the private sector with the right incentive to seek out technological advances in order to mitigate carbon emissions. With the carbon tax and the growth of renewable utilities, we believe that these policies can offset the market failures of climate change. Based on data compiled by the IEA, the timing is ripe for the implementation of a new and dynamic energy policy. Renewables recently took over nuclear energy in terms of total U.S. energy output. And on the global scale, the growth of renewable energy options surpasses that of carbon-based fuels. Putting our plan into action would minimize the looming environmental consequences if the status quo were to persist. Thus, we firmly believe that a carbon tax with a 100% dividend will effectively reduce the use of carbon-based fuels while an extension of tax credits for renewable energy will allow for the capacity to shift towards a greener economy.